Okay, awesome. Thanks everybody for coming on. My name is Kevin Kocek. I'm the founder and CEO of Chemical Q Device. So here for Thursday, May 2nd, 2024. Now this is gonna be about Metalama 3 drug, drug discovery as a generative AI assistant and developments thereof. Um, some of these, you know, Llama 2 or other GPT related uh, LLMs. And I'm mostly gonna be focusing on agents today. I covered fine tuning and RAG last week, and then architecture we'll put off for a little bit later. Um, so these are the basic agents. So you have to know these if you want to do anything with uh, generative AI, just the stock, you know, whatever, if it's just the meta.ai or if you're using chat GPT or hugging face, those aren't going to cut it. Um, you're going to use have to use either some um, for your specific data, fine tuning or rag or like a rag agent. So the way that these go are basically left to right. So the simple one is basically it just, it acts after perceiving a, the current condition. And then they go with increasing power given to the agent. So imagine that, and I'll show you the, in these upcoming uh, specific slides with the you know literature reviews in specific. Uh, and you have goal base, which is giving it a little bit more as far as like, it's trying to accomplish a certain goal and acting like that. And then you have uh, utility space. Now, the big one is the learning agents. So these are the ones that are obviously like analyzing complex patterns. And, you know, when we're talking about using more and more agents, we're talking about, you know, giving the, it the power to uh, analyze code, write code, fix code, these types of things. So, you know, this is happening today. And if you're not aware, um, you know, this is these are the next steps after you kind of learn LLMs is, is the use of agents here. So what we see here is basically the agents in the middle. Now you're going to have a user request that's typically human um, to, you know, basically uh, give this back to the, or you have the agent brain as well, um, the agent core acting as a coordinator. And then you're going to also have planning which assists the agent in planning future actions and memory manages the agent's past behaviors. So this isn't, I believe anything, you know, it's not like straight RAM or anything like that. It's just, this is the agent and it needs to have this memory uh, in a more complex form that just, you know, just RAM that how we imagine it on computers. Okay, so this is the first big paper here. Now, um, this is an ACS publication. It's just done by a single individual, but it's really quite well. And if you've tuned in the past couple months, this LAM MIT, and in specific, it was the four stretching of the protein. Uh, it's this group again that's that's up to this. So they call the paper generative retrieval augmented ontolo ontological graph, which is kind of unique to this paper, and multi-agent strategies for interpretive uh, large language model based materials design. So the, obviously the words that stick out, the ontological, ontological graph is basically a way to you know, map things. So it makes it more interpretable and then multi-agent. And then I'll show you that as well. So the architecture that was used here is basically this Llama 2 70 billion chat. It's very similar to if you were to try to incorporate this with the Llama 3 70, 70 billion parameter instruct. Um, now they also have to use chat GPT uh, 3.5 and 4 for some of these other kind of uh, tasks that's going on. Now what carried on from his previous research is this fine tuning. So they call it mech GPT. So this is a uh, figure like mechanical properties of materials. And this time, you know, well, it's it's still based on the Llama 2, you know, this uh, open orca platypus, but what's different is the training. So now it's on 8,200 question air answer pairs uh, with max tokens of 768, okay? And it, this time these 8,200 pairs are coming from either this book, it's a, uh, atomistic modeling, or Wikipedia. And also they use RAG. So for the RAG portion, chat GPT 3. Point, or sorry, it's just GPT 3.5 turbo and GPT 4 um, to, to generate this ontological graph. And then they said this uses, uh, it's called Nebula graph, Llama index. And then also you have this um, embedding based indexing, which is a, a separate from the ontological graph. Okay, and then you have agents, uh, which is LangChain. You know, so when you get into this, is you're going to see LangChain all over the place. Um, most of the ones that I've seen, you know, with agents use this. It's an enabling type of uh, software platform, and this all mini LM L6 V2 as well. You're also going to get this. Uh, uh, so AutoGen is used for the agent modeling. So now. 
what's shown here is basically two of their different designs. Now, this first one, and actually I read an Andrew Ng uh, article recently, and it actually kind of warns against using this type of thing is that it, it can actually um, you know, collapse the model is what he what he said is basically you keep getting the answer and you keep feeding it back in um, to get a better and better solution. So this can be used, but it comes with, say, you know, some warnings behind it. Now, the second one here with B is you're getting these data sources with knowledge base, and then this gets uh, moved in with the specific ontological graph. So this is the kind of the alternate way of doing this. And then you get this answer here. Now, the really interesting part is basically you have the set of LLM um, agents. Now, this is kind of set up like the office structure. You have a manager, scientist, data retriever, DFT simulator. And the specific task is basically giving it this, you know, it's five, one, two, three, four, five, five, uh, seven carbon chain. And which of these, so if you added another carbon, oxygen, or nitrogen, would create the lowest energy structure. So obviously this is not rocket science. Um, however, it shows the cooperation between all of these separate agents in order to determine in this case, it was oxygen, you know, being the, the best hetero atom, or actually it could have been carbon too, uh, to create that structure um, as shown there. Okay, so the next one here, so this is a very good example of what's going on. Like, so this is emerging research. And I would say, you know, if you're just getting into this or if you're just getting into LLMs, these are those next kind of steps that you'll get, get into. So on the left here is you have these set of agents. Okay, so boss, senior engineer, modeling expert, and reviewer. Now the boss and it's like within real world, might not in this specific case want to retrieve information. Uh, the agents two through four would do that. Okay, and they're working alongside uh, these papers. So in each of these cases, this is a specific application that they're using with moleptinine, uh, protein material expert, and multi-scale bottling expert. That's reflected by the papers. Okay, so they're calling each of these separate papers agents and um, agent two through four can, I believe at any time, access one of these agents that's an expert on that specific source. Okay, so the, the issue is, and I'll get to this a little bit later with uh, Andre Karpathy uh, in one of his kind of LLM talks uh, recently within the past year, is that he talks about it's the LLMs are dreaming and they're basically, it's a compressed version of like, you know, if you have trillion terabytes of data, now you're down to like megabytes of data, or I'm sorry, um, more so gigabytes of data. Uh, so figure like if it's 70 billion parameters, I think it's about 150 gigabytes, but that's not the full representation of the original data. So it can know a lot, it can do these types of correlations, um, but you using like RAG agents here, is it, it boosts up that um, more specific. And in this case, you can cite the source because we know what the sources are because we designated what they were. It's just, you're using the big LLM for context and kind of this reasoning, but now aimed at a specific paper. Uh, these are agents now. Now they said the most, the most um, powerful one of, of them all is basically this, assistant that can write code and the other one can execute code. And, um, you know, in this specific one, it's using the O2 molecule and you'll see here with the energy trying to minimize it as well. So they kind of highlighted this one. It doesn't look like there's as many moving parts, but as far as the, the power behind it, because you're familiar with Copilot, well, Copilot and other services too, these are kind of like the, you know, the, like the, what came before all of like the, you know, more powerful agents and what we'll see today. And you're gonna see more and more of this type of like specialized case where you're using, you know, LLL, LLM agents to make up for kind of like the hallucinations or, you know, even if it's trained on original data set, it doesn't mean that um, it understands it hundred percent, right? There's, there's a level of compression. And I'll get to that with Andre uh, Karpathy's explanations here. So this is the paper that's really interesting. So it's called ChemCrow, uh, and it's augmenting large language models with chemistry tools. And these researchers basically said this is for organic synthesis, drug discovery, and materials design. It's an AI agent autonomously planned and executed the synthesis of an insect repellent. It's called DEET, uh, three organocatalyst. 
and guided the discovery of a novel chromophore. Okay, so these are agents working, you know, uh, in a nutshell, it the AI is getting so powerful that in a sentence or two, say we want it to cost a certain amount, or we want it to have this specific property, or like it has to be this, uh, you know, isoelectric point or this whatever. It just has to be able to do these things. So what it is is basically you have all these separate uh, tools to supporting a powerful, you know, a current GPT four in, in this case. And then it goes over and then it goes straight to the robo reaction. And then IBM is designed by IBM to make the molecules. Okay. So it's really quite an interesting thing because like I showed in the previous example is basically you have all these separate agents They're They have their own specialized tasks or um, skills. And it's just like in the workforce, but now all this is being done with software or some of it. So in this specific paper, we see GPT-4 as the evaluator. Now, the issue with this specific um, case is you have to, you, you have to, whatever the end result is, if it says take 10 steps, like 10 reactions to get to this uh, product, well, the evaluator might think that that's an awesome route because it's it's very verbose and it, it contains, that's typically an issue with today's LLMs is that it just loves this like flowery language and very well constructed things, even if it's not correct. Okay. So it's it's heading down that road. And if you've ever typed into other, you know, GPTs or, or meta that, that AI, you can kind of get the sense where it's just like fluffy and it's just like multiple paragraphs, but not necessarily really to solve the answer because it doesn't know. It's just making things up. Okay. And then so GPT-4 was also the control. Okay. So in this specific case, it said, so say I want this uh, to produce this uh, organocatalyst. Um, and then it comes up with a reaction pathway of how exactly to do that. And those instructions are sent over to robo reaction. Okay. And ChemCro is again, GPT-4, but it's augmented with these chemistry tools. So as you get further and further along with LLMs and using RAG and using, you know, fine tuning, and whatever you have to use is that it's, it's kind of making up for the, 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 you know, it's, LLMs on their own, if you access meta.ai or huggingface.co uh, or uh, ChatGPT, is, you know, they're very, uh, they're well versed on a lot of things. But it's hard to tell if it's just kind of generating things that aren't uh, necessarily useful or if it's giving a direct answer. So the best answers I've got, based on pointing it to my information with RAG, have been the shortest, more concise ones that just answer the question just how it, how it sits. So the tools that they use, uh, and again, there's it's three different uses of GPT-4 here. It's a very similar architecture to Llama 3. Um, they both use transformers. And it's using obviously human, web search, lit search, and all these things. They spoke very highly of the Python REPL, which is it both these agents both write and run code on their own as we as we told them to. And, you know, different, um, so SMILES is basically, you know, it's an abbreviation, uh, being able to tell what the molecular structure is in, in a text form. And some other interesting ones, modify mole, it actually modifies the molecule. Uh, and in some cases, some of these are proprietary, some of these are paid. So I wasn't quite sure exactly. You could look at this paper too, and at the end, it'll go through, just like I'm, I'm saying, like, I want a molecule with these specific characteristics and it's using GPT-4 plus these tools to give you a more accurate response. Now, the other things obviously when you talk about these things is control chemical check. Um, is this something that should be made or is it controlled? And is it something, you know, other issues with safety, these types of things, or even patented uh, molecules. So should it be made uh, by the robo reaction? Now the agent again is this link chain or it's, it's it's actually the software, the, it's the library behind a lot of this to enable the use of agents um, for these types of applications. Now we see here is basically, you know, this first part is expert design chemistry tools. That's the list that I just go, gave you. It's like there's 18 different one of, one of those. And they use the, this all falls under prompting, okay? So when you're using GPT-4, 3.5 or whatever, you're giving it prompts. And the specific chain of thought they say thought, reason, plan is how they used it. 
And this gets, uh, basically, it gets sent to the Rover re reaction and then analyze after that. Okay, so this top part A is, is more like how this whole works. And it's just a brief explanation. Uh, and again, it's it's taking some input. So to say, I want this specific characteristics of this compound at this cost, these types of things. It has the power to do that. And I'll show you in the next slide of all the different molecules they were able to do. And again, here's some of these tools as mentioned above. Um, and there's other things such as reaction prediction, uh, reaction to name, uh, other useful tools that you want to um, say you didn't off the top of your mind know exactly everything what you wanted to do. So this is a very good description of what's done. So again, this is recent. This is late. I think this is October 2023. And they say, find and synthesize a thiourea organocatalyst, which accelerates a Diels alder reaction. So these three at the bottom are all thiourea catalysts, okay? And then it goes on to these other things. And this is, um, you know, you see smiles here. So this is the format of the actual molecule. And this is directly tied to like biochemistry as well. And then it gets sent to robo reaction, which I don't think is anything new. But it's kind of like, an, an it is an end-to-end -end application. So if I only want to tell the software in a sentence or two exactly what I want made with, you know, either based on uh, certain characteristics, you know, physical properties, chemical properties, you know, that's what you would do. And the ones that I highlighted here, these are the ones that they actually were, be, they were able to use with Gen AI, you know, with this chat GPT-4. And then on top of it, they use the, um, their specific chemcro, which is GPT-4 plus the chemical tools. So you see the the DEET, uh, the three catalysts here, and then the chromophore in the lower right-hand corner. And here's an example. So it's not always the case that GPT-4 is worse than the chemcro, but it just gives you an example. So say for like, you know, when I pick out my own RAG data that I want to use uh, versus this, um, that you see, ChemCrow was able to do this in a single step. So you just take these two separate molecules at in THF at 25 degrees C and you get the organocatalyst, okay? But the GPT-4 route, like just the main mainstream one that you would just say, uh, type into, you should be able to type this straight into GPT, I, I believe, chat GPT. And, you know, you get something like this. So it's these one, two, three, you know, it's multi-steps with uh, protecting groups, it's a very uh, more detailed route to get to this catalyst. And again, you could take this and you could send this um, to, and this might work. Actually, I think they said in this specific case that maybe two of these steps don't work, but there, there could be uh, answers that make sense with GPT-4 that are just longer. And again, I think that's the main in a nutshell is what you'll see with when you're working with LLMs is you're typically after the shorter, more concise answers. And those are basically, they, they come from when you have more specific data as opposed to relying on a, a you know, the a general framework like www.meta.ai or, um, you know, chat GPT. So they said with the GPT synthesis, some inaccurate IU, IU, <laughs> IUAPEC names described reactions not Need. It, it had issues with multiple of these uh, incorrect routes, unnecessary protection. So you see these Bach groups, those are protecting it uh, at that specific reaction point, and then you deprotect it at a, at a later time. So um, anyways, in this specific one, this was actually in the, in the supplement. So again, it's on a kind of per basis case as far as which works best when, um, but the big thing is that it does work for some molecules. Right. So it's it, I'll, I'll get to the end slide where it shows kind of like um, which was better in it and in what cases. Now, here's for the chromophore. The input is basically what you give um, as a human chemist for the AI model to work on. OK. And then it's as specific as it, the final step that says suggest a synthetic plan for the one with wavelength closest to 369. And then you can see at the bottom um, it's close to 369. So as far as how specific you can get, uh, it's, you know, you kind of have to go through the paper. There's a lot of examples, like I said, in the supplement that are very specific questions like that you or I would have as saying like, could AI even come up with this? 
let's, let's give it a shot. Um, there's other tools as well, but I think what you'll see, like say reaction, I forget what these things are called in like SciFinder and these types of things. But, you know, there's other tools to use as well, more standard tools, but you're going to see this power with using multiple agents yeah, or and tools too, uh, with the main LLM that, you know, this is the, this is the software to kind of work on here. And so this is the catalyst again. So remember I showed you those three catalysts. So this is Takamoto's catalyst here. And this is basically saying plan the synthesis of this organic catalyst, okay? So then it goes through this and you can see even in more detail in the paper too, as far as uh, other ones, but here's an example. This is an input. So this is something that I want. So plan this uh, synthesis and it goes th through the specific um, chain here. So you get smiles to action input, observation thought. Now the issue of what they found, and I mentioned this before, is with the evaluator GPT, which is GPT-4, but it's used as, as an evaluator, like the GPT-4 output, even though expert evaluators did not like it at all. So, you know, the issue right now is it, it likes its own kind, meaning that it likes kind of like the verbose or fluffiness, even though it's not correct. And they said that, Using GPT-4, you know, usually the answers would sound a lot better, um, but if, in incorporating all these tools, and there's probably additional um, improvements in that too, is that sometimes the answers are just like plain, you know, it's not like flowery. So it, that, that was the issue of a study uh, here is basically the evaluator GPT is basically not looking for 100% um, accuracy on the chemistry side. Whereas the expert, expert evaluators that they had on their own, these human evaluators really like this answer. So, you know, it's just one of those things. It's just, it's, it's all likely getting better. Now, here's what they showed as far as like, they said it tended to be like the more complex tasks uh, favored ChemCrow. And you can see the error bars are quite large here. Um, but, you know, they were able to get it working, like I said, with the uh, the DEET and then the three organocatalysts. And then, so that's four. And then also with the, um, the chromophore. So that's five, five of these molecules to make up a, a or I shouldn't say that, but like design a, a good pathway and then send those reaction uh, details to the IBM robo, you know, uh, chemistry, you know, robot to make as far as like a fully autom automated kind of thing. So, and you see here in the lower right-hand corner, they, you know, evaluator GPT score, they kind of um, didn't look at that as much just because, you know, the, we're still experts as humans, but the, the, like the computer has a lot more that it can kind of um, chunk through, but in this case, that uh, not as accurate. Okay, any questions at this point? So these were two papers, you know, all within the past year. The first paper I covered was 2024. And then the other paper um, was say uh, later, so October, 2023, I believe. And then, so if not, I'm gonna transition a little bit into, so this is if you go to meta.ai and it should be pretty similar to ChatGPT. These are trained on a lot more data sets than you would ever believe for most of us on biochemistry, chemistry, medicine, uh, biotechnology, uh, and I'll show you some of the data sets that you can, that they're trained on. Um, but obviously there's some inherent issues with, uh, you know, the hallucinations, these, ty these types of things. Okay. So, um, you know, basically they're, they're going to require fine tuning and rag on specific data for high accuracy. Is there a question? Uh, hi, Kevin. Uh, sorry, I joined late, so I didn't uh, get to hear the first part, but uh, I have a question on the, uh, this second paper, you uh, showed that paper where they have, uh, you know, the Dale Salder reaction or or something similar. And they, uh, you know, you said, you know, they are trying to get a meaningful uh, chemistry uh, prediction for those predicted reactions. So uh, one way to do that is to check the kinetics of the reaction, to check if the reaction has a high energy barrier or something like that. Uh, in in our in my research, uh, uh, you know that I've been I, we just published a paper on this, 
that uh, if we have say you know a bunch of smiles for reactants and products can we predict their transition states and can we predict the energy barriers using machine learning and not using uh, uh, you know language models but using say other, uh, other regular graph neural networks or something like that uh, do you think that uh, you know those kind of things uh, can help uh, here in yeah. this yeah, it, anytime you add additional learning components, it, it's definitely going to help. And, you know, say if they're using 18 tools, it's it's definitely helping in that case. Um, so we can come back to that uh, towards the end, you know, as far as like a longer conversation with it. Mm. And then so this next part here is basically this is um, if you take these mole instructions from this ZG UNLP, it's basically their training set that they use, it has this exact instruction and then it has the answers as well. So what I did is meta AI, so it's meta.ai, um, it's based on Llama 3, 70 billion parameters. And you can use that as well, but it's really slow if you just have a single A100. Actually, you're probably gonna need at least 300 gigs of RAM. So anyways, if this worked, this would be awesome because you could take these mole instructions and then plug them right into the, the web browser and then get the correct answer. So as you can see, this is probably not a correct answer. And you could start to see, you know, some of the, especially the, the I think these are valines here, the triple Vs, um, and it's a, it's a shorter sequence too, but it'll go through and then it'll explain all of these because it's it's seen a lot of these important data sets um, you know, based what we've seen before. And I'll, I'll show you in the coming slides too, as far as like this part makes sense and this part makes sense. But the thing that you have to remember, whether you think it's an accurate answer or not, is that LLMs are, are trained on much data. And it might be pulling, you know, part of this answer from one, you know, part of a data set that's biochemical uh, related and a different one. So the one that the author kind of came up with that came up with the question, this mole instruct is this is the answer that they gave is this rather lengthy, um, you know, it's probably a couple hundred uh, amino acids in this in this specific case. And they also give, you know, the rationale behind it. And I asked it a uh, list all data sets that was used in this one. So these are big data sets, Unipro, PDB, NCBI, enzyme correction, gene ontology, Actually, it shouldn't need the, well, yeah, I don't think it needs the gene. Um, KEG, PFAM. So it's just, it's deceiving to to look at the data sets that Meta.ai was trained on and then, you know, uh, base every, your whole research off of that, okay? Because there's, there's compression, there's hallucinations, there's things that we don't fully understand about it. And in fact, if you ask it, and this is separate from the previous study, um, please list all of the medical data sets you are trained on. So it gives a list, of it, a list of at least 10. I've got at least 20. I've got up to 20 on one of these. And then which are the ones, uh, please list all the biotechnology data sets. Uh, here are all the pharmacology data sets. So again, I don't think it's an accurate tool to use today, you know, for you know, designing proteins or DNA and these types of things. Although it's based on a lot of this data, it just doesn't know how to put all the pieces together quite yet. And I think that it's getting a lot better, but it's it's definitely not something that you would want to use solely as a research tool for very specific answers, okay? And Andre Karpathy goes through this and he says, basically it's, it's more involved. And he says, think of it as compressing the internet where in this specific case, 10 terabytes of text you know, and this is the the part where you hear if it takes hundreds of millions of dollars to train. I think Met, uh, Llama three was over a hundred million, and um, you know, so they're saying two million at these many flops, and then one hundred forty gigabytes corresponds to seventy billion parameters for Llama two, and it's very similar in size. It, it should actually be very similar for Llama three, uh, seventy billion in these cases as well. So Andre Karpathy is kind of an AI expert in the space. Uh, he's definitely, you know, done stuff with Tesla and uh, I think OpenAI at one point too. And it says it dreams of things. So it says, 
you can look at it like there's a Java code dream, Amazon product dream, a Wikipedia article dream. And again, for, for I would say general information, so this goes for Betadai AI or ChatGPT or Hugging Face or others, or even Grok probably, is that um, for the general stuff that people ask a lot of questions for, they, you know, they it does use RAG to a certain extent, but it's not going to uh, sit and, you know, if it takes several minutes or several hours to do RAG with the general model, I don't think it's going to do that. And then it says, so how does this work? It's basically, you know, we know there's billions of parameters and how we know how to iteratively adjust them to make it a better prediction, uh, but we don't really know how they co collaborate to do it. So an example, I don't know if this is still the case, you could try it, but if you say, uh, who is Tom Cruise's mother? It'll ret return the correct answer, Mary Lee Pfeiffer, but who is Mary Lee Pfeiffer's son? And it, it might say, I don't know. So this video is quite recent. I think it's within the past year. And uh, it's basically, I'll put the link up there too with that. So, you know, in all these things, you just want to keep in the back of your mind that if you're looking, if you're doing research and you need something specific, um, you're really trusting on a lot of other things to, to work. And you could have, you know, basically you're, it's a lot of times they can't even actually tell you where it got the data from. So that's an that's an issue there too, and so I covered these. And if you you could actually ask Meta.ai create a table with Laura fine tuning, RAG and agents benefits these types of things that'll create it. And what I mostly covered here was agents. Okay, so I covered those the other couple pretty well. If you want to retrain on a modified arch architecture, you're going to have to find a data set like with Llama three. It's not available. Right, so you, you're going to have to train on the original architecture with some other data set, and then on a different architecture like yours, you train on that same data set and then compare the two. I think that's the only way of doing that. Um, so if you want to, you know, incorporate tensor networks, which is done a number of times uh, with the transformers, uh, that would be something you could do. So, um, you know, basically everything moving forward is going to be biochemistry, drugs, you know, uh, generative AI, these types of things. And if you look on a computer screen, most times it's in 2D. And unless you're fresh out of organic chemistry and biochemistry and what other, if you took neurochemistry and these types of things, that it does help to, to see the physical aspect of what's going on. So when I made this structure of phenylalanine, the phenyl right ring definitely uh, sits flat, okay? So this is what C6H5 uh, at this point. And then alanine is this uh, top portion here. So I know there's a lot of people coming from a lot of different perspectives. So this is the the, the backbone of uh, polypeptide chains or, or proteins. So NCC, so in this case, NH3, the chiral carbon or methine. And then this back carbon here, that's that would have been the alanine, uh, but it's substituting one of the protons for the phenyl ring. And then it's at neutral pH, which would be NH3 plus and then COO minus. So, and it, it actually gave a pretty good answer as far as, uh, you know, what is or the importance of phenylalanine in drug discovery, antibody drug conjugates, probes for protein confirmation, peptide based images, antimicrobial activities, and more. Um, so again, like, you know, that, that's the, the caution out there is anything that you ask. And in this case, I, I can actually view sources and it did give me the source Royal Society of Chemistry. And you also want to check that too, because is all of this stuff coming from Royal Society of Chemistry? So you can ask more specific questions. And I did not have good luck saying, use this as the rag source. Um, but if I, if I said, uh, provide this answer, but it has to have sources, then that was something that um, it could do. So in this specific one, there was one source. And I think, I, I know not all the chat GPT ones provide uh, sources, but basically anything that you can point to, you know the source of, right? So that information you get back, um, it can pinpoint what the answer is, then you can check it in the book, right? So I guess, and Andrew says this uh, quite well. I, I just watched one of his videos and he, he, he actually was his, uh, one of his blogs. And he says, you know, um, be very careful, keep, fe of keep feeding your answers back into the model because it could just, you know, uh, collapse the model. 
And in this quote, he says, given a comp complex task like writing software, a multi-agent approach, so agents, uh, would break down the task into subtasks to be executed by different roles, such as a software engineer, product manager, designer, QA, engineer, and so on, and have different agents accomplish uh, different tasks. So this is Andrew Eng. He's the founder of deeplearning.ai. I would highly suggest to, to sign on to the newsletter. It's called The Batch. And then he does, you know, YouTube video. He's most famous. I think he's taught a, uh, taught a course on machine learning before all of the Gen AI got big. And he, you know, very thorough uh, in his explanations. So I, the other thing to take from this too is that, you know, they say ChatGPT or Llama 3 or any of these or, you know, Gemini, you know, it's not going to directly replace people's jobs in most cases. It's the people that can use the tools. So I would say, you know, it's hard to tell, but in grade school and college is like, you'll more be expected to be able to use these tools for certain parts and then other parts, you know, uh, more of the, you know, the, the hard labor. Um, but that's how, that's how things are going. And when you see things like uh, an agent for the software engineer, an agent for the product manager, uh, for the designer and QA engineer as well, is that, you know, these are playing the roles of these people. So for those attending and those watching on this uh, discussion, it would very much behoove yourself to, you know, really know generative AI, agents, um, fine tuning, rags, these types of things. And, and the limitations of today's LLMs, right? Because you can, you can get back very verbose stuff from any of these, right? It's kind of dreaming, right? Even if it was trained on 15 trillion tokens, you know, like a, a more modern numbers with these things. So any other questions? So as far as everything compared to today and what's what's currently available, like you have to think of what's um, like the core software, like with LLMs today, yes, you have like billions and chat GPT has gone into trillions of parameters, especially with I think GPT-5 is, um, you know, that's just, that's a lot of computational power there because it, it can look at all these uh, pieces of data in a big chunk of the internet and then assign parameters to certain topics or graphs and, and these types of things. So if you're talking more of just like, um, you know, more already existing machine learning tools is that, you know, I don't think that they typically have that power built into it as far as LLMs, right? So I think that's the big thing. And if you're talking about agentic behavior, you know, setting up um, agents to code, uh, to execute and to um, fix errors, you know, that that's another thing. And it's all enabled by better hardware too, because the GPUs, like the H100 is I think 141 gigs of RAM. They need to update the A100, it's only 40 on CoLab, but there's A100s with 80. So it's the it's really the hardware that enables it too. and the massive amount of storage it takes. If you just have 150 gigs for your 70 billion parameters, like for Llama 3, then imagine what it is for everybody else's too. And how many times do you upload similar types of models to Hugging Face? You know, that's it's storage and compute and, you know, bandwidth, those types of things is, is what we're talking about. But yeah, that's the that's the clear difference that I see with today's tools that most people use, and then LLM based tools is if you have one that you rely on with other tools or RAG or fine tuning, um, that would probably be a better substitute than other tools in chemistry and biochemistry that are used today. Any other questions? And feel free to put in the chat as well. So if you came late, so this is basically uh, agents for this specific talk. And one of these was more like end to end. So the one that I, I think is really worth looking at is the ChemCro. And again, I think this was later last year, I think like October, uh, the GitHub is up with it. So I would de definitely check that out. And um, it'll all only get better. Now, the interesting thing with this, if you know about LLMs, is the temperature. They kept it really low. I've never seen it this low, uh, but if that's okay, that's okay. And then usually the models 
you know, uh, demos, I'll see like 0.6. But basically 0.1 of temperature means that very concise answers, you don't want creativity or elaboration. You know, it's really trying to set things down. So if they said that they were still getting all of this kind of verbose, you know, awesome responses, but they're incorrect um, at temp point one is interesting. So, and granted, these are hard tasks like ChatGPT. The primary focus was not to uh, generate molecules, uh, even though it's it's you know it can be it can be trained on and some of these uh, data sets. So that's the one for uh, ChemCrow, and then. Any any other questions? And I'll have all this up and definitely. So if this is just, you know, if you let if you missed last week, not only look at like Andrew Eng's stuff and Andre Carpathia's is my last week with especially for drug discovery is that I covered, um, you know, the fine tuning uh, rag in, in pretty good detail. So that's that's up on YouTube on it's chemical Q device. Any questions? So Kevin, uh, maybe I can uh, clarify my uh, question from before. Uh, uh, so like the idea is, uh, you know, we, in, in our, in my research, we start with the a reactant and a product pair and we, uh, you know, generate those manually, or we we ask some experimentalist, or or we look for those in some data sets where people at least uh, you know used some known reactions, where someone said, "Hey, this is one sort of a deal solder, or this is one sort of a substitution reaction, or this is a ring opening reaction," and uh, then we do things from there on. Now. In ChemCrow, when you were, you know, presenting on it, at some point of time, you mentioned that it can provide the reaction. Uh, so did you mean like it can give both the reactant and the product uh, from like from the language model? Yeah, so it's based on these tools. So whatever each of these tools can do, so say for instance, like for functional groups, like you want it to have carbonyl or you want it to be an ester or amide, those types of things. So that would fall under that. And I think a lot of these are based under the IBM, kind of like this uh, Robo reaction is, is the way that these look like. Um, but you can get, like I said, in the paper at the end, like so in the uh, supplement, they go through, I don't know, like maybe 15 or 20 questions where it says just those types of things. Um, it, as far as it's, I think it was typically the outputs. So say like, I need this to be at this specific cost and this and that. And I, I think what, whatever, and this goes for any kind of like uh, synthetic chemist or, you know, biochemist is basically whatever software tools today, you know, those were based on, you know, the available hardware, uh, like just regular machine learning, if it's supervised learning, or unsupervised learning, but not with massive a number of parameters. So basically, you can run all these in the cloud, and the hardware is enabling it in order to implement all these tools. So say, for instance, like they said for web search, you know, they could use, but it was preferred to use literature search, right, as opposed to web search. You know, probably more academic. And some of these other ones, the smile ones, are, are more kind of uh, common. Similarity I've done in a different LLM. Um, but it's basically, you know, I, I, I think that's the case that you're going to find is, you know, what's the type of machine learning that was used to develop today's tools instead of like the emerging tools and, you know, what type of hardware requirements. If I run on a 70 billion, um, you know, Llama 3, I typically get better answers than the 8 billion. Okay. And I, I think that's a good reflection as far as like, you know, if you're just doing things that were based on reinforcement learning and it can only look at like two or three variables at a time, um, th what this is saying is it's taking all of this, you know, reaction predict, 
uh, reaction planner, reaction execute. So whatever you're able to do under each of these, you know, is is basically helping you, um, you know, get to the endpoints. So they they gave like a sentence sentence or two explanation for um, for the ones that were really important and and other other ones too. But I. You know, I think it's opening the door up to, you know, very powerful reaction planning software. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, you know, because, you know, here the list is pretty long and uh, uh, the applications are too diverse uh, because they, they, they say, you know, you can search the reaction, you can check the reaction, you can plan it, execute it and do, you know, get some summary out of it. So th this is like talking about all different kind of things. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, when we are like studying some, like a reaction, there are generally two type of uh, approaches. One is to check the energies, uh, stabilization. If the, if the, something goes and reacts how how much is its interaction energy if if the interaction energy you know if if, if the the energy goes out that means that it's, it's a lower in energy thermodynamically stable the other thing to look at is like you know the kinetics of the reaction so i have seen uh, in drug discovery people checking out the thermodynamics part of it I am not aware if uh, kinetics uh, is actually used. And uh, now because I'm working on kinetic uh, models and, you know, methods, I, I just was trying to uh, see if there's an application here. Uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll certainly look at the paper also to, to find more about it. Yeah, I mean, beyond just the like the hardware advance advancements is it's really the prompting. So say for instance, like if you could just describe all that like in a sentence or two, and then you just give it to ChemPro versus standard GPT four, you know, how how well, you know, if you're just looking at reactants, whatever you want to do, uh, how well will it perform? They did make this open source uh, to a certain extent. You can run it on hugging face. I think you need to log in at some point, um, but on GitHub they do have some notebooks too. So I, I would I'm probably going to be checking those out. Um, but I, I think that's where everything's headed is is trying to make it as as very easy as we can. And I, I think with a lot of these explanations, they can be defined in a sentence or two, and then the AI, um, you know, based on GPT four or Llama three, just because it can do that anyway. And now incorporating these chem tools, you know, can can address that in, in, in like a sentence or two. Any other questions? So if you joined a little bit late, so this is the second paper. And then the first paper, it featured more. So this is a huge slide. So I don't think it's coming to many people super fast, but as you can see, some of the agents names are software engineer, modeling expert, reviewer, or even boss. So um, if you missed this specific one, this is basically, you know, agents are supposed to be very specialized to their own specific skills. So software engineer is different from a modeling expert. And if they want to, you know, look at these specific sources, say in a sentence or two, then uh, they can use RAG. Uh, to get for molybdenine is basically uh, it's like graphene but with molybdenum and it looks at the paper uh, based on molybdenine here and likewise it, this was for a specific application so it, it they needed to know about molybdenine protein material expert and multi-scale modeling expert so as you can see you know like your literature studies can go up and up um, but it's something to be aware. And I, I think that phrase that even, I think uh, Jensen Wong used it in NVIDIA is, is especially, you know, and like AI on, on itself, like it needs to be plugged into the wall. Well, who gives it electricity? We do. You know, so there's those interactions with humans to begin with. 
um, and we have to mine it. And I'm sure there'll be robots for that. But just keep in mind, it, it's more about like the people that can use the tools to say like, okay, you're given a task to read this paper, um, but uh, you know you are are good and you know rag and you know how to uh, use an agent to if you have a single line question to ask it, even though you might have to still read the paper anyway, you know? So it's like, you know, it's just more and more reliance. And the way I explained to other people is that we've had automation for some time, but agents in specific are gonna be a whole nother level of automation. Cause now if you could see that there's errors and correct the errors, write new code, those are, those are typically associated with uh, human-based jobs, right? So we're going to have different jobs, I believe, and, you know, in a more supporting role of AI. But I think it's absolute, absolutely paramount to know um, beyond just your domain expertise, if it's in drug discovery or medicine or ph pharmacology, to now use AI to support that your domain expertise. But I, the way it's looking like, I don't think you'll be able to get away with just the domain expertise. And that's kind of reflected uh, Jensen Wong kind of uh, said that. It's more paraphrase. So I would, you know, as far as getting started, uh, because it's just, you just have to watch a bunch of YouTube videos. And if you have coding experience, experiments too, be very savvy about finding other, you know, notebooks that are Apache 2 or MIT, you know, these types of things. And data sets are usually CCBY 4.0, meaning they're pretty open. And then you just start developing, right? And I, I don't think just a regular education in AI will hold up. And in, in fact, Jensen at NVIDIA said, don't get a computer C, uh, science degree at all. Um, I would say get a couple of semesters in you, uh, but it's more gonna be about the uh, practical application in the field, working with AI, and advanced software, you know, uh, increasingly better hardware. So, yeah, I, I, there's still some time for sure, but I, I think you would want to be diligent as, as far as saying, like, if your boss says, oh, okay, well, somebody else, or let's just say positively, um, you know how to use RAG and, and fine tune, and you know how to use it with agents, and you can accomplish these tasks like this, and then you know, somebody else's job is going to change to support that. Like there's going to be differences, but I, I, would ex I would, I would expect, especially for me, a lot less late nights coding and, o and overnights coding um, where the computer do does that, but more using your domain expertise, interacting with LLMs or, you know, Gen AI uh, to get answers that instead of like, ex you know, explaining in several paragraphs in, in a sentence or two, and then it does that one. And then you say, oh, okay, I need this agent to, the, to do this, or, you know, they're all automated. So, but these are both good papers. And like I said, a lot of times if they're LAMA 270 billion parameter, um, uh, in this specific case, I think it's just the original. And then this other one, this fine tuning, this one uh, for ACS, their MEC GPT. It's based on a different paper, but they said they had a better data set with these two here. So they use Wikipedia in specific for this kind of materials-based stuff, and then for atomistic modeling with 8,200 QA pairs. And I'd also be interested because like, you know, a lot of times just things just don't work anyway, like on your first try, and then you just have to keep, you know, getting better. So if anybody wants to put in the chat or you can come on to, to just, you know, describe some of your victories that you've had. Um, but I, I'm still trying to get this one. It's a molecular instructions as I showed before. So it's based off this data set here in the lower right. And some of them, I think it's just, it's either too complex how I'm doing it. Um, I tried to change the optimizer from eight bit to 32 bit, which is more, that's, that's actually full scale and eight bit is, is like quarter. And then I changed the learning rate. It helped just a little bit, but I'm still trying to get one of these to work to fine tune a llama three, uh, 8 billion parameter on this specific one. And I would recommend this. So you could do protein design. There's like four or five different types of protein design. I'm working on catalytic, um, 
So for this one, that exhibits the desired activity and specificity. So there's other ones where you can so go the other way. So based on a on a protein sequence that you already know, um, so represented by one letter codes like this, you can say to uh, describe the uh, properties of it. Uh, this is with mole instructions, and this is pretty recent, I believe. I think this is 2023, but it's a lot better than the some other. Um, Kind of biochem data sets that I've seen. So, and there's, you kind of have to, if you're fine tuning, you can only pick like one of them at a time, uh, like one of these sub data sets. I think the short, the smallest one was like 60, 60 megabytes, which is decent size. You know, just the, the saying goes, it's the application thereof, right? And <laughs> I would highly suggest keep coding, you know, for everybody. I don't think that's over. I think that's still a huge thing. And the only way that I really learned machine learning was by coding, like changing the learning rate, changing, you know, optimizers, loss functions, you know, loss, you know, schedule loss, these types of things. And I think that's the only way. Because if you just learn it, it's like just book smart. Um, but to interact with with computers and software, I, I think that you still have to code. <laughs> any other questions regarding any of the other slides? And again, I'll have these up. Um, the so the last one did quite well, like over seven thousand people saw it on YouTube, which is phenomenal. And it's the specific area that people want to be in. So people want to do you know Gen AI drug discovery these types of things. And that's what it excites people because they use it all the time, like meta.ai, chat GPT. So, um, you know, only specific fields in, in AI, I think will continue to flourish. And you would be surprised the number of other principles uh, from supervised learning. Uh, with Llama 3, they actually, towards the end, like uh, before they assigned this, uh, you know, this instruct models, the seven, uh, the 8 billion and the 70 billion parameter, they do supervise learning, meaning that the data sets at that uh, point are labeled, right? So most people would say, oh, it's just fully unsupervised. No, to get the best results, they're actually mixing in other types of uh, machine learning. And at one point, I heard them say, you know, it's actually classification at sp specific times of what it's doing with words. Like it, it literally classifies words. So that would be something more associated with, you know, just a simple binary classification. So, you know, I, based on other people's kind of uh, reactions to this too, is that, you know, it seems like a lot of the attention is show, shifting to this point and those attending, you know, you probably already figured that out. And those online, you know, it's it's something definitely to, um, I'd say actively get involved. And it is complex, you know, RAG, fine tuning, uh, agents, these types of things. But if you've learned other types of machine learning, you should be able to do it. That That's my experience so far. Uh, anybody else that we haven't heard from? So Andres or Edwidge? And other resources to check out. Uh, check out, if you search in for generative AI notebooks in Google, you'll get the first one for me is um, it's Gemini's. They're all Apache too. So you just go on there. They have specific ones for health. Um, and what's unique about Gemini is it's multimodal. So meaning, and this is the type of technology that Apple's been, you know, interested in. So you can in, input text, speech, image, uh, I think video as well. And then you can also output those, any combination. So Llama 3, uh, they said they're going to have a multimodal model. And I think ChatGPT, I, I don't know if they keep Dolly separate or how they do it, but they do stuff that it, that is multimodal. So just keep in mind of these things, like if you can store, they're calling it a tiny large language mo model on a phone that does, um, you know, that takes in all these different input, uh, input types. 
Now, I think just because of the logistics, if you just want to do text generation, the Llama 3, um, you know, chat, chat GPT 4, or it's going to be 5 pretty soon, that's probably still the best bet. But if you want to do all this other kind of cool stuff, like on that GitHub, that um, Gemini's GitHub, um, which is Google's, that, that seems to be an option too. And, you know, based on other questions that I've got, if, you, if you're if you lost in hugging face, just look in the upper right, left-hand corner, like in the uh, models, and you'll see text generation, multimodal, text-to-text, uh, -text, um, text-to-speech, speech-to-text. And like, you have to figure out what you really want to do. And that's a good starting point. And data sets will be important to, um, you know, parameters, model size. You can all do all kinds of stuff. You can uh, just, they're called LoRa uh, adapters. And it's basically these fine tuned parameters that go on top of the original pre-trained model. And you can just save those. So people might actually like those <laughs> because then you don't have to don't download the whole model. Uh, if somebody just wants to see your adapters, your lower adapters. So just lots of stuff to work on. And, you know, I'd say just looking ahead, it's just, you know, you have to go through a bunch of stuff first, and then you can say, okay, this for sure. Because if you want to take like biomolecules and be the fastest to the market, say like your customer has a, a line, like a single uh, sentence, they say they want this done, that goes directly into AI. The molecule is made. It ships straight to their warehouse. <laughs> I'd like to say in record time. So that that's an example of an application, and you know something that's likely feasible. Um, the robo reaction I showed earlier I don't think is new, but it's that pipeline of it's the convenience factor of saying like when this gets better, you know, type this into this line. And they did have five molecules at least that worked. Um, but do you see what I mean? It's like, it's it, it's less and less of the human planning and that's kind of baked into the software, right? For it to do. And I mean, it could be energies, you know, so thermodynamic product or kinetic product or... But I, you know, I would say if there's a question as far as like whatever today's software can do, I'm pretty sure that this can do a lot better. Okay, so any other last questions or comments? Appreciate everybody coming on. And definitely um, to stay in tune, definitely Andrew Eng, uh, deeplearning.ai. You have Andre Karpathy. You have me with uh, Drug Discovery. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of good resources out there. And just specific topics, if you want to do Llama 3, RAG, Llama 3 fine tune, just search on YouTube and just, you know, take, take some screenshots. Awesome. I uh, appreciate everybody coming on. This has been Thursday, May 2nd, 2024, uh, episode 133 for uh, Meta Llama 3 drug discovery, generative AI uh, assistant. Uh, have a good rest of the night and have a good rest of the week, everybody. Take care.